Assalamu alaikum. Um, welcome to part two, um, session one. Um, in this session, we will be um, going over the management of safeguarding. That's part two of keeping children safe in education um, and the changes that have come about. So in paragraph 78 to 83, there is greater emphasis now on um, added to the role of the governing body or the proprietor. So um, safeguarding responsibilities are upon the governing body and the proprietor, um, whereas now, um, and obviously for staff to understand um, safeguarding procedures and policies in school, that would be the head teacher's responsibility. But to actually enforce and put together the safeguarding procedures and policy is, um, is upon the role of the governing body and proprietors. There has always been a clear expectation that there should be a whole school approach to safeguarding, um, whereby safeguarding and child protection underpin all relevant policies and procedures. Um, but now the emphasis, the, there's greater emphasis on the fact that um, safeguarding of children should be at the forefront of everything um, in school. So all systems and procedures um, should take into consideration the safeguarding of children at all times. Um, like we mentioned in previous um, sessions, um, that it is at all times, the best interests of the child should be kept at heart. So uh, in everything, in all procedures, systems, um, in school, the child's best interests should be kept in mind at all times. Um, the school should ensure that there are clear procedures in place. Sorry, the, the school should ensure that there are clear uh, procedures in place that children can come and share what is happening with them if they're worried about something or if they want to report any kind of abuse. Um, the clear systems and procedures should be in place that children can come and share openly with um, any member of staff that they feel comfortable with. Paragraph 85 of Keeping Children Safe in Education. Um, there, um, there have been some um, additions of what is expected um, in the child protection policy. So previously, there were expectations of what should be included in the child protection policy. Now there have been some more additions and we will go over them with you now. Just to say on that point as well, Khadija, that the mistake that's often made by schools is that we've used our local authorities' child protection template and therefore we've covered everything and that's not been the case at all in a number of schools that myself and Khadija have reviewed um, policies. You, you really need to ensure that not only are you using your local authorities um, template to guide your, your policy but also that you are paying very close attention to keeping children safe and often we find that that hasn't happened so a number of areas have been omitted. And that's now strengthened um, much greater. And this is why we are sharing with you um, in, in this session, what needs to be included in your safeguarding policy. <clears throat> now we are recording this session today on the 25th, uh, 24th of August. 1st of September, the implementation of the revised guidance becomes statutory. So your safeguarding policy needs to ensure that it is reflective of those changes, as well as what your local authority advise, and that is ready to be um, shared with your, your staff and um, it's available uh, publicly as required um, from, from that date. So we, we have a very short time frame, brothers and sisters, so it's really important that you are paying very close attention to what Khadija is going to share with you now about what needs to be included in that policy. Khadija. If I can just add to um, what Hasin's just said, um, she's absolutely right that local authority will only provide um, a template to you, but, but 
each and every school must ensure that it's personalised to their school and their children's needs. Um, again, local authorities will just cover the main points and the local procedures. For them, the main responsibility on the local authority is to put across local procedures to the schools. So you can't just use the template and think, well, we've covered it. You need to go back to all the... Um, government guidance and make sure that each and every point is covered but not just covered and copied and pasted from the documents you need to ensure that it's personalized to your school and your children's needs okay so point one would be a whole school approach to peer and peer abuse again you need to ensure your school approach to peer and peer abuse is personalized to your children's your pupils needs so what works at a school down the road might not work for you for your pupils so your pupils, you might need to change procedures slightly to ensure that it's personalised for your pupils in particular. Um, clear reporting systems. So the policy should have clear reporting systems on how abuse, um, peer and peer abuse, any kind of sexual abuse, neglect, physical abuse would be reported. I think that's really important. We 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 discussed this at length in in our part one. Uh, videos and we talked about how it must be absolutely clear in your policies and actually the, the word clear is is reinforced quite a number of times through and repeated throughout the the document um the guidance that if i am a member of staff in your school do i know how to report it do i know the processes of reporting the templates that i need to use who that information is going to go to what's going to happen next and actually, it's got to be clearly shared with pupils as well, so that they are clear how they're going to report any peer-on-peer um, -peer abuse. We, we've really gone into length on, on the changes that the, the revised guidance have, has, has raised on peer-on-peer -peer abuse. So this is just moving on to your policies and procedures and, and reinforcing that your, that your protection charge protection policy um, must be very clear about it and I think that what we've seen in quite a number of, of safeguarding policies that it's not clear and the steps that need to be followed um, uh, need clarity if, if staff are really going to understand now you have to remember as well brothers and sisters that because this is such an important part of, of, of um, part two Staff are likely to be asked during an inspection, what procedures do you have for reporting? They've got to be able to share clearly and coherently what your school processes are. And that's why when we, when we delivered part one, we talked about the need to have greater time allocated to sharing these changes in keeping children safe as part of your staff training, which is going to be taking place um, prior to the start of school but I think that's it's really important isn't it Khadija that that part is it is it's made, it's made clear yeah absolutely um, outline clear procedures which are in gov um, with, in accordance with government guidance so like keeping children safe in education and other statutory guidance you have to have clear procedures in your policy, which are in accordance with the government guidance. But again, you, in addition to that, you need to make sure there's a personalized approach for your school, what works for your school. So like I said to you before, just copying and pasting from the guidance would not be sufficient because like Sina just mentioned now, that staff would get questioned, pupils would get questioned, and you need to ensure that that is personalized to your school. Reference to locally agreed multi-agency safeguarding arrangements put in place by safeguarding partners. So again, this goes back to local authority, what your local procedures are. So, um, and that's where your um, the local authority template would come in use because you'd use your local procedures from there um, in your policy because that would be um, your local procedures because the local procedure in one borough would be different to local procedures in a different borough. And that's what you need to bear in mind. Uh, reference to policies. So online policy, um, online safety policy, you need to ensure that there is reference made to that in your child protection policy. Um, there should be a reference made to the SEND policy also. Um, I'll touch upon that a bit later on in the session. Um, again, um, I've not added that here, but 
um, a reference should be made to your behavior policy as well. That would be good practice. So it's not, it's, you know, it doesn't say in keeping children safe in education, but it does all, it, it all interlinks online safety, behavior, the SEND policy, it all interlinks in one way or the other. Therefore, reference should be made. Um, also your anti-bullying policy because that falls under safeguarding as well. Um, just, just to say here, Khadija, that often schools are under the impression that they don't need to have a SEND policy because they don't admit pupils with special educational needs and disabilities. Um, you, first of all, it's a statutory requirement to have one. Um, you need to have a SENCO in your school appointed to support children um, who need support within your, within your school setting. Um, it's also important that you are absolutely aware that this revised guidance on keeping children safe has quite consistently referred to children who are vulnerable and will not be able to share concerns about abuse as easily, perhaps, as children who don't have those vulnerabilities. And so it's really important, the reason that Khadija has mentioned the SEND policy here, that you are clear how children in your school who are deemed vulnerable, who sit on a SEND register, and a child that has a hearing impairment or a visual impairment or, or anything else that might obstruct their learning, um, how would they be supported to, to report any abuse that perhaps they faced? So if you've not got a SEND policy, you certainly need to have one. You do need to have a SENCO in your school who is named in, your, in, in that document. Uh, there should be reference to um, local procedures there as well and your local offer. And also, as Khadija mentioned, uh, your child protection policy should make reference to your SEND policy. Um, the child protection policy also should reflect serious violence. Um, now, if um, when you go back to the document keeping children safe in education, they've actually used the word where appropriate. I've removed that from the PowerPoint um, because what, I'm going to explain why I've removed that because the reason he says where appropriate in the guidance is because, like I said to you before, that some, you've got to personalize it to your school. Now, school down the road might not have such a particular problem with serious violence, but you may, it might be a, a very big problem in your school with your pupils. Therefore, greater emphasis should be put on serious violence in your policy. Um, and if you compare your policy to the schools down the road, they, they'll have serious violence in their policy, but they wouldn't have emphasized it as much because there's not a need to. So you do need to have, your policy must reflect serious violence, but where in the policy it sits, that has to be a personalized approach according to your school and what mm. your pupils' needs are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it should be reviewed annually and updated before that if needed. Um, I mean, that's um, not new, is it, Khadija? I mean, we should, no. you know, we should be yeah. reviewing our our safeguarding policy um, annually, anyway, and updating as those changes um, come to us. But I think it's the next part which is really quite relevant because um, often when there are safeguarding issues in school, staff don't think, leaders don't think that well, we need to now go and update our policy. They've dealt with the safeguarding issue and they've followed whatever their school procedures are there and they've got a, a case file on it. But what you now need to do now, and it's good to explain this to you, integrated now into keeping children safe is about making changes to that policy based on what you've now come to learn. So could I'll let you expand on that a little bit more. Yeah. Um so the other thing that needs to be um, included, like the reason they've put that, like Hasina said, this is nothing new, but they want this written. Now, a lot of policies I've seen, it won't say um, that it will be reviewed annually or before that if needed, whereas some policies of some schools um, will clearly say that on the front cover. 
Um, you also need to write in your policy that it will be publicly available um, via the school website. And if a school doesn't have a school website, then how, um, how else the policy will be available to parents, et cetera. That needs to be written in the policy. Okay, reference should be made to additional risks pupils who have sent or physical health issues may face and how you will address the challenges this presents. So now, again, like we explained in the previous session, now it's not just about children with um, special educational needs or disabilities. They've actually added on um, the fact that children with certain physical health issues are also in the vulnerable category. So you need to add in your policy um, you need to make reference to those children in your policy and how you will address the challenges that these children may face when reporting um, or facing a safeguarding issue. You should also has, have, like I just mentioned previously, um, a system in place and procedures in place where children can confidently report any abuse and that includes peer and peer abuse, knowing that they're concerns will be treated seriously. So you have to be very, very specific now. It can't be a vague sentence in your policy. It has to be very specific and very clear in your policy uh, what your procedures are going to be to enable pupils to confidently report any, in any type of abuse and the fact that they will be treated seriously. So what, as a school, what procedures are you going to um, put in place that children feel that they are, their concerns are being taken seriously? that even if there are no reports, so a statement needs to be put in your policy, that even if there are no reports of peer and peer abuse, the fact that you are aware that it may be taking place, um, just because it's not being rep reported doesn't mean that it's not happening. So you have to um, portray in your policy that you have a culture where you believe that even though um, it's not being reported, you're, you're going to act as a school, the culture, the safeguarding procedures are going, to be in place where you are going to believe that it is happening, but it's just not being reported. So children are being safeguarded at all times. Um, just sorry, sorry, Khadija, just to stay, just um, uh, to reinforce that point that um, as Khadija mentioned, you need to include a sentence in your policy that you are aware that just because the school doesn't have cases reported to you, that these cases will may still be taking place and that you have systems to address those and also that you that you as a school are going to create a culture of where it it becomes easier for pupils to to report so i think that it's really important that when you're making your changes to your um, child protection policy that you're including that statement and it's clear um in your policy because it, it, inspectors will look for it when they when they review a statement which makes it clear there will be zero tolerance um, to a, a approach to abuse. Again, this statement has to be in your policy that there will be, you know, the school has a zero tolerance approach to abuse. Um, the fact that, you know, it should not be passed off as banter or part of growing up, that, you know, that was expectation last academic year as well, for that to be part of your school policy. Um, but now they've actually added that it should, it should not be passed off as boys being boys as this can lead to a culture of unacceptable behaviors and unsafe environment for children so i will add in the fact that nothing should be dismissed as banter part of growing up or like it says here boys being boys because what you're the message you're giving out to pupils and staff and the culture you're creating is that it's okay it's acceptable and that is not what we're supposed to be doing um, therefore, a clear statement should be in your policy of that. Um, also, that should be the case. You, you should be reinforcing this with pupils at all times. So even when um, even when children are just, you know, pupils are just having a banter with each other. Um, I was just speaking to someone the other day where, you know, there's this thing about dissing each other. And, you know, they're saying so many unkind things to each other. But, and you know, staff have passed it off as you know, it's okay they're just growing up it's part of banter but you've got to think about the mental the impact it would have on their mental well-being later on so that is why nothing should be dismissed as banter part of growing up or even boys being boys 
um, because what you're the message you're putting across is that it's okay, it's acceptable. I think it's really important, Khadija, that staff um, are reminded about this during that inset day that's going to yeah. take place to share the changes to keeping children safe, as well as you, there is an expectation, brothers and sisters, for you to share the revised safeguarding policy uh, with your staff. I would give a copy to each member of staff in your school. And as, as we've said before in part one, it needs to be shared with every single member of staff. That includes your lunchtime supervisor, your administrative staff, everyone that should be there. And, and actually, we, we talk about this zero tolerance approach. Um, myself and Khadija were in a school recently where a member of staff, um, a member of the senior leadership team said that there are times when administrative staff are not able to join um, uh, safeguarding training sessions. That's just not acceptable. And so you've got to make sure whatever training you are organizing for the start of September that, that all staff are present and that these points which are being made uh, clear to you about what needs to be included in your child protection policy are reinforced. So give examples to your staff to say you are walking along the corridor and you can and you can hear two children speaking or a group of children talking and you're hearing information that you find to, to sit within this. Um, so something that you would have earlier have passed off as being banter. How are you going to manage it? How are you going to address it? What expectations do you have on, upon staff? Whose attention are they going to bring it to? So really important that you are making that really clear um, in your staff training. Thank you, Khadija. Um, abuse in intimate personal relationships between peers. Now, again, I'm going to add here um, that unfortunately in the society that we live in, in the times that we live in, um, we cannot turn a blind eye that this does not happen between our children. Unfortunately, it does, and we have to we have to work in the best interests of the children. So we need to be, we need to have an open eye to to see that these you know abuse can take place between children that are in intimate personal relationships, and that's why we need to be vigilant to that and ensure that children are safeguarded at all times. Um, yes, it, it's, you know, it's against our school ethos, but unfortunately, like I said, um, in the times that we are living in, we could not turn a blind eye that it does not happen. It does happen, and we have to work in the best interests of our children to ensure that they are safeguarded at all times. Um, causing someone to engage in sexual activity without consent. Um, so it's not just before it was about um, forcing someone to do something um, sexual, but now it's like it says in this paragraph, it's not just about being involved in sexual activity. It's forcing someone to do something to themselves, which is sexual, um, but they are being forced to without their consent or consent. So therefore, um, that would be that has to be included in your safeguarding policy as well. Um, and what they've also added is to engage in sexual activity with a third party. So that's a new addition as well. And you need to make sure that is quite clear in your safeguarding policy. Um, and like Zina said before, and I've said before, that it's not just about it being in your safeguarding policy. It's about the fact that you are reinforcing this across um, the school. You ensure that children are safeguarding. They, they. I think we need to create awareness amongst our um, children as well that these things are not acceptable uh, and how they should report it. Okay, paragraph um, 117. Um, has been added to make clear expectations about safeguarding training um, where it now includes online safety. So now there is expectation that all safeguarding training, whether it's done at induction or at the beginning of the academic year or whenever it's updated, online safety should be part of all safeguarding trainings. There's a greater emphasis on online safety because like I said in a previous session, there is no difference between reality and online life for these children. Therefore, online safety is very, very important that staff are aware of the risks that children are experiencing to and how to deal with them. I think it's important as well um, that leaders are um, re recording the access to safeguarding training that staff have. They are aware of staff who are unable to attend uh, a, a training session that might be organised. 
How are you as leaders ensuring that those staff who've missed that opportunity um, have another one to, to ensure that across the school, everyone has taken part in the same training, that they are clear about their responsibilities, that you are clear that they understand those responsibilities. It's not just about providing access to online training and saying, right, okay, we've done that now, so our staff should be aware. Your responsibility is to ensure that they understand um, what it is that is expected of them. What would they do if they were to find that a pupil had faced um, uh, some safeguarding issues as a result of being online? How would they manage it? Who would they report it to? So I think it's really quite important that you are clear about the, the type of online safety training that your staff are going to access to ensure that every member of staff in your school setting has access to that and where they don't, that alternative um, uh, times are um, arranged for them to do so. And that as leaders, you're keeping a very close eye on the amount of, of, of safeguarding training that staff are having. When do you think uh, an update will be required? How often do you think those updates are required? So it's really important that it's not just about providing the, the training, but, but having a whole process around um, safeguarding training that ensures that your school is creating that safeguarding culture within the school. I'm not sure if you want to add anything more to that, Khadija, but I... I, I think you've covered it, Alhamdulillah. Okay, paragraph 118, a new paragraph has been added um, where they're making reference to the teacher standards and expectation within the standards around behavior and understanding the needs of all pupils. So what they've done is, this is a new paragraph that's been added. So previous in previous um, guidance, it wasn't there. So they've added this paragraph in which they've made reference to the teacher standards. Um, so expectation of staff behavior and um, the need to understand, the importance of the need to understand the pupils that you work with. Hasina, would you like to add anything there? Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. We, we are going to talk about this um, later on when we do part four, um, but the expectations on staff conduct um, has been significantly reinforced in this new, in this revised guidance. And this just reinforces that further, um, that when you are on a programme of, of teach training, there is an expectation of the conduct that is expected of you in this profession. And the fact that keeping children safe is now making a reference to that um, makes it really clear. And so as a school, what is it that you need to be doing um, around ensuring good behaviour amongst pupils, about your own professional conduct, um, to ensure that, that you are creating this culture of, of safeguarding, that, as we've mentioned already, that you are not dismissing um, conversations between pupils as banter, knowing that actually that can lead to other things later on. So th this, the, uh, the reference to this um, is really quite important. And, and, and actually, um, it's something that inspectors will want to know, what is it as a school you've done to ensure that you are making clear expectations on behaviour and conduct um, across all levels of your school community. Okay, schools are now expected to adopt a more personalised approach when teaching safeguarding and online safety. Um, so paragraph 119 um, sets out the expectations that schools have to adopt a personalised approach um, when teaching safeguarding and online safety to pupils um, to ensure that their needs are met effectively. So what works for one group of people um, might not work for a different group of people. Therefore, it needs, you need to take a personalised approach um, when teaching safeguarding and online safety to pupils. So you need to work out what is going to work for individual pupils. Um, like Asina had said in previous session, one size does not fit all. Therefore, you need to take a very personalised approach when teaching safeguarding and online safety. And actually, they, I think as well, Khadija, the, the, the questions will come that if you have um, a group of vulnerable children, if you have a group of children who have been known to have issues um, previously online, 
How are they being considered? How are they being addressed? If you have a group of pupils in your school, perhaps, that are, that are very active online, are you going to be taking a different approach to pupils who perhaps are not as active? I think it's, it's quite important that, that you and your, and your team um, are, are looking at the needs of pupils. And that, I mean, that's part of our new um, Ofsted framework. And um, the fact that our curriculum needs to meet the needs of our pupils. What is the starting point? How are we going to address a, a group of pupils um, whose needs are very different to another group of pupils? And so we're already aware of this um, because of the changes that came into the, the education inspection framework. And, and now it's been reinforced further because we often deliver a program of safeguarding and believe that it's, it's had an impact on all pupils in our school community. That's not necessarily so, and, and, and Offset are, are, are very aware of that. So have you as a school ensured that everyone in your school community is understanding the responsibilities when being online? Are they aware of how to keep themselves safe? And so, that, that word that, that sits on your screen there, personalize, um, is really important that you, that you sit down in, and, and consider the needs of your, of your pupils. Yep. Right, the, um, paragraph 121 um, is just, um, this, the guidance has now just added specific resources that may help staff teach about safeguarding. So obviously now there is expectation uh, for schools to be teaching about safeguarding. So paragraph 121, um, it just gives you some specific resources. Um, I'd like to add here that, yes, you know, you've got this session and you, but I would still expect all members of staff to read uh, the guidance in detail. Um, Part one, all members of staff have to read. Part two, obviously, management. And part two onwards would be management. But you do need to ensure that you go in and you um, you go back and you do read the document in detail. Because this is just an overview that we're covering and we're only covering the changes to ensure that you are aware of everything um, and to refresh um, and to make sure that you reinforce um, procedures in school. You need to ensure that you read the relevant parts of keeping children children safe in education um, for September 21. Paragraph 123 and um, 235 now covers online safety. Now previously online safety, there was just reference made to it in the document and then there was a separate annex that covered online safety. Now what they've done is they've covered online safety, they've brought it into the document. So online safety is covered between these paragraphs in the actual document and the annex to online safety, which is annex D, it just gives you access to resources which are relevant to parents, pupils in particular and staff. So, so the annex now doesn't give you any information on um, guidance on um, or information on partic particularly on online safety it just gives you access to resources um, and websites um, they have actually brought online safety into the main document main body of the document um, and that's covered between 100, um, paragraph 123 to 135 Okay, so it, what does it cover? It covers the key points, so the four areas of risk online, um, because the risks that children are exposed to, they've broken it down into four categories. Um, first being content. So what are children being exposed to? Illegal stuff, inappropriate, harmful content, for example, pornography, fake news, racism, um, the fact that they are exposed to self-harm and suicide um, and that they can be groomed for radicalization and extremism online as well. So the content, what are they being exposed to? So that is the one risk online that, um, that they've covered. Can I um, just draw you back? Um, I don't know if you can recall this, I'm putting you on the spot here. Um, but it was quite recent that we, we came across um, a website in our in our primary school that some that some pupils had come across 
and we then wrote to parents informing them about that website can you can you recall that one oh, i can't um it was yeah, something I, that, I, I do recall what you're referring to, but I can't remember the name of the website. Yeah, so I think that I'm, I'm sorry, I've put you on the spot there. But but what I'm what I'm trying to bring to attention here, brothers and sisters, is that this this I mean, that particular um, incident came about because pupils were having a conversation in the playground about a particular website, and it seemed to them like it wasn't anything that they had to be concerned about but it had all sorts of ramifications. And um, it, our local authority actually wrote to us about it as well at, at, at a similar, at the same time. By that point, actually, we'd written to parents already. And so it's really about making sure that although you're going to include this in your, in your safeguarding policy and uh, ensure that you are aware of the need for online safety training and curriculum uh, offer to your pupils. It's also about what it is that you're doing about it when it arises. It's not just about, well, we'll teach online safety and children will be safe. It's really about knowing how to deal with it when it occurs, knowing that there are, I mean, there are going to be websites that are coming up all the time um, and other social media uh, channels that pupils can access and you come to know about it it's actually how are you um, addressing it so in our school for example I'm going to be able to tell you um, that we were made aware we've addressed it with a particular family and the, the family didn't know they didn't know that the risk that this particular website um, uh, imposed upon children and, and were very very receptive to the conversations that were had um, and obviously then we wrote to all parents uh, in key stage two we also um, delivered another session with our pupils so it's really not just about knowing that content um, is an area of risk but actually when it when it's something that you come across um, how are you managing it how are you going to do with it how will you strengthen your um, procedures for staff and pupils? What will you do to make parents and pupils aware? How quickly do you react um, to that information? So we did it immediately. Um, within 24 hours, a letter had gone out to parents. So it's, it's, it's that as well that needs careful consideration. And, and content obviously is one of the greatest areas of risk online. Um, and that's why we have filter systems in our schools and all, and all sorts of other things to ensure that pupils are kept safe. But it's about knowing what you will do as a school to ensure that pupils are kept safe. Um, when you come to hear about or know about other um, unacceptable um, content. So I thought I'd just raise that there, Khadija, because I think that it just comes to show that really there are, it's, it's going to be, quite regular isn't it because like I said yes. you're going to get websites up and coming all the time or all sorts of other things that people can access and it's about how you're dealing with it and who's dealing with it in your school who's going to take leadership of this and that these questions really need to be answered because as Khadija's mentioned online safety now sits in the main document it's been put there for a reason brothers and sisters if they didn't think it important enough they would have left it where it was but the fact that they've brought it into the main document, the fact that they are that they are um, strengthening its importance, that the need for staff training and um, extending the requirement upon schools means that they expect you to be extending your provision and strengthening your processes. And so it's really important that that time is taken as leaders to sit down and really reflect on what it is that you're doing. What would you do if something was to happen in your school? How would you manage it? How would you deal with it? So although we've just looked at content here, but it just goes to show what exactly is required of you and your school. Sorry. I'm glad, uh, yeah, it's fine. I'm glad you mentioned that because um, I just remembered that I should add that, um, yes, Hasina said, you know, we have filtering systems in school, but unfortunately, not all parents um, have, you know, child-friendly internet. 
you know it's not filtered at home is it so um and not all parents have the knowledge of how to do that and that's why educating the parents is really really important on online safety as well to to you know make them aware of what their children could be at risk of is really really important and another thing i'd like to add um is child friendly games well they come across as child friendly now i'm going to give you an example of uh, a game called roblox um now that's child you know it's age appropriate but some of the things that children can be exposed to are very very indecent on that game and um you know it's inappropriate and it can be harmful and therefore a lot of times when you hear children discuss games online do not turn a blind eye thinking oh they're only talking about a game please be inquisitive and ask questions or listen and find out what it is that they're discussing because it's really really important to ensure that children are safe just because it's a child-friendly game doesn't necessarily mean they are safe from all harm um, because each and every game that they play online um you know various different settings will expose them to different kind of content so it's really really important that um you stay quite vigilant when children are discussing online games etc So contact, um, that's one of uh, um, the risks online as well. And that's being subject to harmful online interaction with other users. So again, that happens through games. It can happen through peer and peer, uh, you know, peer and peer pressure. Um, so, you know, they can be um, bullied online. They can, you know, one peer can expose another one to something which is inappropriate, harmful online. Um, they could be talking to an adult. Now this happens on games a lot. Um, and I personally have experienced this myself, not myself, but somebody very close to me has experienced this, where the children think they are talking to somebody, uh, talking to another child. However, it's not a child on their, on their end. You know, um, it is an actual adult. So, and that's where the grooming will come in, et cetera. So contact is another very, very uh, big risk that children are um, exposed to online. And that's why it's really, really important, like I said, when children are discussing things online, you know, discussing online games or anything, it's very, very important that you stay vigilant um, and you ask them the right questions um, to ensure that they are safeguarded. And again, creating awareness amongst parents, um, making them aware of what their children can be exposed to, why it's important that they are there in the room when their children are on the internet or playing games, um, because, there's so many risks online, um, and this is just one of them. Conduct. So personal online behavior that increases the likelihood of or causes harm. For example, making and sending, receiving explicit images, images consensual and non-consensual sharing of nudes and semi-nudes, um, or pornography, or sharing um, explicit images or online bullying. So it's not just about what they are at risk of, but the risk that they are putting themselves into by, by their conduct as well, what the risk they're putting other children to by their conduct as well. So, you know, it's about sharing images, um, sharing pornography, um, exposing others to images which are explicit and not suitable um, and bullying as well so it's their personal conduct and behavior online as well um, that is a risk because they are then becoming a risk to others online and obviously it's a still it's still a safeguarding issue on themselves as well because why how have they come to become a risk to another child so they must have gone through something for them to now conduct themselves in this way so again that needs to be taken into consideration as well And another thing that's now been added is commerce um, risks such as online gambling, inappropriate advertising, phishing or financial scams. Now financial scams is, is quite a big thing um, now. And if you feel a lot of pupils have experienced this, a lot of adults have experienced this as well. So if you feel that they are, you know, you have been, ex you know, a pupil has been exposed to a financial scam or they you know they've been taking part in online gambling etc there is a dedicated website 
for commerce, reporting commerce um, related risks online. Um, and that is um, the link provided at the bottom. It's an anti phishing group, um, and therefore, um, you know, you can seek help and advice on that website. Um, now, if I just go back, sorry, it's just reminding me that um, if I go back to um, conduct where um, children are, ex you know, ex exposing others to um, explicit images or maybe sharing nudes of each other. Um, in this case, if ever you come across a case of this nature, then where you've got older pupils, um, you can either advise them or you can help them report that to CEOP because CEOP is an organization that has the authority to take down nudes or images or videos that have been shared online. Um, inshallah, we will cover that uh, in more detail um, in one of our online safety sessions. Okay, so what we're going to do now, uh, we're going to end this particular session and then we'll be back for part two, um, session two um, in the next video, inshallah.